As I hope you noticed, when speaking about evidence of contamination between different witnesses just a minute ago, I alluded to the use of marginal notes and their importance. I don't want to spend much time now on notabilia, memory aids reporting in the margins the names of important topics, maniculae, the small hands pointing to particularly relevant passages in the text, and all that may inhabit a manuscript margins. I have already emphasized the need to have philology, codicology, and paleography collaborate when working on a critical edition. All these marginal elements must be studied by using the tools of these three sister disciplines. The information relegated in the margins of a manuscript can often prove as important as that in the body of the text, if not more. That's why it's always much better to see a manuscript in person than rely on a photocopy, a microfilm, or even a CD-ROM. It often happens that the margins and reproductions you receive from the library are cut off. This is certainly a pity, especially when a manuscript was written by a humanist or under his own supervision, thus making it possible that his own hand is to be found in the margins. A case in point is a copy of Salutati's reply to Loske's invective. I've already talked about this work of Salutatis when I remarked how different humanist Latin and the knowledge of Latin can be from one generation to the other, especially between the end of the 14th and the first decades of the 15th century. The manuscript I'm referring to now is number 94 in All Souls Library at Oxford. When I worked on this twofold critical edition, that is, Loska's invective against the Florentines and Salutati's much longer reply, this copy proved fundamental in a number of ways. It was produced between 1403 and 1406 in Florence, that is, either immediately after Salutati finished this work or three years later at the most. Like many manuscripts belonging to Salutati's own library or reporting his text, it was decorated in the Camaldulensian monastery of Santa Maria degli Angeli, as its decoration reveals, and copied by one of Salutati's favorite scribes, as confirmed by comparison with other well-known copies. The quality of this exemplar is remarkable in all respects. The text, in beautiful script, a so-called litera textualis with humanistic traces, is almost impeccable and the decoration is first-rate. No wonder it caught the attention of the French Cardinal Pierre de Turi, who bought it in 1409, eventually bringing it with him to France together with other witnesses of Salutati works and having his coat of arms added to the first page. It then entered the Duprat collection, another famous French book lover, in the early 16th century, when an only partially successful attempt was made to paint the Duprat coat of arms over Cardinal de Turis on the first page. More important still for our purposes, though almost impeccable, as I said, this text is not entirely free from mistakes. There is no such thing as a perfect witness, as all philologists know. And yet, its errors are reduced to a minimum thanks to the care that the scribe and, most likely, Salutati himself put in making this copy. Evidence of this is in the two marginal notes that the scribe inserted on folios 36 verses and 39 verses, in an elegant a script as possible, to integrate words that he had dropped by mistake. In the first case, the omission was limited to a single word, nostre, in the second, it was much more conspicuous, being a case of saute du même au même, literally jump from same to same, that is a passage omitted because two words in it are identical or have the same ending. A mistake of this kind can easily occur when practicing what the French call dictation interne, inner dictation the habit of reading words and saying them silently to oneself before copying them out, as was common in medieval and Renaissance scriptoria. For instance, imagine that a group of copists working independently had to write down a phrase like this. Yesterday I went to his house. You know how much I like his house. It's on top of a hill and surrounded by gardens. In a number of cases, this passage would probably be transcribed as follows. Yesterday I went to his house. It's on top of a hill and surrounded by gardens. From a philological point of view, the problem is that, even once corrupt, this phrase makes perfect sense. A scribe not familiar with the original wouldn't feel any need to intervene. 
and a loud dictation, however, that is when someone is reading the text out loud and dictating it to the copist, such mistakes are less likely to occur. That the Oxford manuscript was written under dictation of this kind, maybe with Salutati himself acting as dictator in the philological sense of this word, is revealed by several characteristics. Among them, the most interesting is the one that leads to the last topic of our video, the use of punctuation in humanist text and what principles an editor should adopt in this regard.